on the holiest day of the year, the holiest Jew went into the holiest place. On the holiest day on Yom Kippur, the holiest Jew, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, went into the holiest place on earth known as the Kedesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies. And the question comes to mind, how do we celebrate Yom Kippur today? Unfortunately, we are in exile. There is no holy temple. And we have no Kohen God, though we have no high priest. Furthermore, why is Yom Kippur only one day? In exile, in the diaspora, outside of Israel, most biblical holidays, we celebrate two days. We celebrate two seders on Pesach, we celebrate two days on Shavuos, we celebrate the first two days and last two days of Sukkot. So why is it that when it comes to Yom Kippur, in contrast of Rosh Hashanah, that we celebrate two days of Rosh Hashanah, when it comes to Yom Kippur, we only celebrate one day and not two. What is the mitzvah of Yom Kippur? Maimonides, the Rambam, tells us in Mitzvah 49 that this day of Yom Kippur is a day that we bring the offerings in the Holy Temple. It's a day of confession a day that we achieve atonement. And then he concludes that we follow all the laws written in the Torah portion of Achrei Mois. So what happened? Yom Kippur, and what led up to Yom Kippur? Seven days before this auspicious day of Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, left his home and entered into a special chamber in the Holy Temple. And there in that chamber, he stayed for seven days. And those seven days were days of reflection and introspection, days of purity, to prepare himself for the auspicious day of Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur itself, the Rambam goes on to tell us the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, immersed five times in the mikveh. Not once, like he did on a normal day, but throughout the day, he went five different times into the mikveh, into the ritual bath, to immerse and to purify himself. And on that day, he entered into the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies. Now we are told that no one was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. Throughout the entire year, even the high priest did not enter into the Holy of Holies. On Yom Kippur, he entered numerous times into the Holy of Holies. And the Torah tells us, in the Torah portion of Achrei Mois, in the book of Leviticus, the Torah portion that we read on Yom Kippur, that when the Kohen, Godel, the high priest, entered into the Holy of Holies, the Torah says, Adam mayid. And no man is allowed to be in the Oil Mayid in the Holy Temple. When the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, goes into the Holy of Holies. And the Jerusalem Talmud goes on to say, what does that mean, v'chol adam? And every man is not allowed to be there. Says the Jerusalem Talmud, afilu oison shekosav behem udumus p'neim p'nei adam. The Jerusalem Talmud in the Tractate of Yuma, chapter 1, law number 5 says, that even the supernal angels, the 
angels of the highest caliber, the ministering angels, are not allowed to be in the Holy of Holies or around the Holy of Holies at the time that the high priest enters into the Holy of Holies. Only the Kohen Gadol and God are allowed to be there. And the reason is because Yom Kippur is a day that expresses the oneness and the unity between God and the Jewish people. And therefore the Kohen Gadol, the high priest that represents the Jewish people, that is the Shaliach, the emissary on behalf of the Jewish people, he enters into the Holy of Holies together with God. And this concept is even higher than Torah, is even higher than the connection that a Jew acquires through Torah. And the proof is that in the second holy temple, when the Arona Kodesh, the holy ark, was no longer in the Holy of Holies, it was missing, yet the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, still entered into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. Because Yom Kippur is a day that reveals the oneness and unity that exists between God and the Jewish people. So if Yom Kippur is so great and so holy, and it represents this oneness between God and the Jewish people, the question begs to be asked, what about today? Nowadays there is no holy temple, we have no Kohen Gadol. How do we acquire this connection between God and the Jewish people? And the answer is that today each one of us is likened and takes the place of the Koyin God or the High Priest, which is one of the reasons why in Yom Kippur we wear the kittel, we wear the white garb that is synonymous with the white garments that the Kohen Gadol wore when he entered into the Holy of Holies. Because all of us today are the Kohen Gadol. And we are entering into the Holy of Holies. How do we do that? So we are told that prayer takes the place of sacrifices. And on Yom Kippur, there are five prayers. Throughout the year, we pray three times a day. Shabbos and Yom Tif, four times. But once a year on Yom Kippur, we pray five times. And as the Alter Rebbe writes, it is Yom Shenes Chayiv B'chom Tfilos. It's a day that it's obligatory to pray five prayers. And these five prayers allude to the five levels of the soul. The first level is nefesh. Nefesh means the level of the soul that brings about the action. And then you have ruach, which is the level of the soul that deals with the emotive speech or the emotions. And then the third level of the soul is neshama, which deals primarily with thought. The fourth level of the soul is called Chaya. Chaya means life. This deals with Ratzon, with one's will. And then you have the fifth level of Yechida. Yechida means oneness, or only. And this represents the Oineg, the pleasure of the soul. That the soul is truly one with God in complete unity. Now, throughout the entire year, when a person prays, the average person can only elicit three levels of his soul. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama. If you're lucky, you're able to, to access even a fourth level of the soul. However, in Yom Kippur, each one of us has the ability to unveil all five levels of the soul. We find that Chana, when she was in the Holy Temple praying for a son. It says over there, Hashem, and she says to the Kohen Gadol, to Eli Koin. she says to him, I pour out my soul before God. 
when she prayed, she prayed with all five levels of the soul. However, many of us cannot do that throughout the year. On Yom Kippur, however, a day that is so great and so holy, a day that expresses the unity between God and the Jewish people, the fifth level of the soul is revealed. And that is why we are told on this day, Lifne Hashem Titaru. On this day, you will be cleansed of your sins. Why? Because you stand before God. Chassidu says, Lifne Hashem Titaru means before God you shall be purified. The word Lifne means higher than the name of God. That Lifne, you stand on a spiritual level, on this fifth level of the soul that is higher than all four letters of God's ineffable name. The four letters of God's name, the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He, this represents the four worlds of Atsilus and Bria and Yitzira and Asiya. However, on this day of Yom Kippur, Lifne Havayi you stand on a level that is above and surpasses and transcends this level of God's name. And because we're so high and we're so spiritual and we are one with God on this day, Titaru, we are cleansed from our sins. In other words, God lifts us up out of the mud and out of the muck and out of the darkness of this world and He brings us to a new reality, a reality beyond creation, and there, automatically, there is no sin. God sees no sin, and therefore we are atoned for all of our sins. And this answers why on Yom Kippur we only celebrate one day. If you look into the Code of Jewish Law, chapter 624, halacha number 10, over there it says the reason why Yom Kippur we only celebrate one day is because it's simply a sakana. It's dangerous. If a person is going to fast for two days straight, no eating in between, it's a big sakana. A person can die. And therefore, we don't require a person to fast two days. God does not ask man to do something he cannot do, and therefore we only fast one day on a deeper level. Based on the teachings of Hasidus, it says, that why is it that on Yom Kippur we only fast one day? The answer is that on Yom Kippur we are compared to angels, malachim. That's why we wear white garments. And similarly, uh, we don't eat on Yom Kippur, like angels who never eat. And just like angels that are beyond time and space, and they are beyond exile, so too on this day we are beyond exile. So the second day that is celebrated by the people of exile are celebrated only when we are in exile. But on Yom Kippur, we are beyond exile. On Yom Kippur, we are on the level of angel. Lufnei Hashem Titaru, before God shall you be purified. We ascend to time and space. So on this level of perfection, on this level of oneness with God, there's no reason to fast a second day. And this also gives us some insight on why we have five prayers. Even though during each of these prayers we have the ability to access all five levels of the soul, nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yechida. However, the fifth pr prayer, which is ne'ila, primarily accesses in a very deep way the fifth level of the soul. And that's why Ni'ila is considered to be the greatest of all the prayers. What is Ni'ila? We say Ni'ila literally means the closing of the gates. But that's not what happens really. What Ni'ila means is 
that God closes all the gates between us and the nations of the world. He locks everybody out. He even locks the angels out. In the Elah, he closes all the doors to his private chamber, to the Kodesh HaKadoshim, to the Holy of Holies. Only the Koyin Gadol, only the High Priest, every single Jew, and God are standing there face to face. No angel, no nation is allowed to enter at this time. For this is the time of Yechida. This is the time of the fifth level of the soul. This is the time of true unity between man and God. And so at the time of Ne'ilah, God embraces his people, Am Yisrael, the people of Israel. And he says, I and you are one. So Yom Kippur is all about spirituality. It's all about holiness. It's all about leaving the everyday world. It's becoming an angel, a high priest, becoming one with God, becoming so holy that no longer can we or do we have any affiliation with sin. However, that's only the first part. The second part is action. We read in the morning of Yom Kippur, the portion of Achrei Mois. What is Achrei Mois? It talks about the death of the two sons of Aharon. And God tells Moses to tell Aaron, don't be like the two sons of Aaron that died in the Holy Temple. Don't be like the two sons of Aaron who died in the Holy of Holies, but rather you should come out. In other words, if you come into the Shul on Yom Kippur and you become so spiritual and so, so holy that you truly forget about the everyday world, then you simply died in the synagogue. You died in the service. The objective is to come out of the temple. And that's why we read the portion of Achrei Mois after the, the death of the two sons of Aaron. To remind us that Yom Kippur is not only a day of spirituality, but it's also a day to be proactive. As we mentioned many times that as we enter into Yom Kippur, it's a day of charata al ha'avar, we regret the sins of the past, but the day of Yom Kippur itself is Kabbalah Teva Lahaba is a day that we have to acquire new resolutions to better ourselves in the year to come. And that is why we find a very interesting tradition that the Koyin Gadol, the high priest, was not allowed to sleep the night of Yom Kippur. In other words, after preparing himself seven days in holiness and in purity and in introspection and reflection and preparation, now finally comes Yom Kippur, we are told that you're not allowed to let the Kohen Gadol sleep. He has to be up the entire night. Why? Because something might happen. As it says in Ethics of Our Fathers. What's the real reason? What's the real reason why the Kohen Gadol is not allowed to sleep? <clears throat> In truth, sleep is a very positive thing. We are told that when a person sleeps, his soul ascends to its source. It becomes one with God. It nurtures new vitality, new life. It has many, many spiritual revelations. And in truth, the soul now becomes affused with holiness. So you would think the best preparation for the Kohen Gadol, the high priest who has to work all day on Yom Kippur, and he has to do all the services that throughout the year are done by an ordinary Kohen. On Yom Kippur, he does all the work. He needs the sleep. Yet we say, no, you don't let him sleep. Why? Because something unholy might happen. Chassidu says 
that the reason is because Yom Kippur is all about action, not about sleep. When a person gets so holy and so inspired, he forgets about the main thing, and that is the act. The most important thing is the action. And therefore you cannot be sleeping. You have to be awake. We find this pertaining to Aaron Akoyin. The Torah says that you should know after God told Aaron how to light the menorah. Fayas Cain Aaron. Aaron did exactly as he was commanded. And says Rashi lahagit shvachi shal Aaron shino. This tells us the great praise of Aaron HaKohen that he did not change one iota from that which he was commanded. The word Shina means change and also sleep. He did not sleep. What does that mean? So the Rebbe explains something very interesting. He says that Aaron HaKohen knew the power of the menorah. Aaron HaKohen knew when he lit the menorah he wasn't simply lighting a simple candle. He was igniting all the souls of Israel. The seven branches represent the seven different types of Jews. There are the Chesed Jews who are kind, and Gevur are critical Jews, and Teferes, those who are merciful, and Netzach, and those who are very victorious. They're always fighting for Jewish rights and civil rights, and Hoyt, those who are into PR and praise and acknowledgement. And those who are into Yesoid, into bonding and friendship, and Malchus, and those who are into leadership, there are different types of Jews. And the fact that Aaron HaKoyim lit these seven candles, he was lighting up the souls of all the Jews throughout the entire world. He was very high spiritually. He knew exactly what he was doing. And you might think that because he understood this great service, the importance of every detail, how the lighting of the candle could affect tens and hundreds of thousands of people. He might be very nervous. He might stand in trepidation. And he might change from the responsibility. He might pour the Shem and Zayis, the oil, all over the steps or all over the branches, and he might knock over the candles because he knows this candle is going to inspire hundreds of thousands of Jews. And yet, Loishina, he did not change. You know why? Because he was not asleep. He was not traveling in the higher realms. He was down here in the real world, in the world of action. And so the Koyin Gadol, the night before Yom Kippur, even though he's going into the Holy of Holies, he has to realize it's about action. It's about bringing the Holy of Holies back into the everyday world. That this inspiration of Yom Kippur has to manifest itself in everything we do throughout the entire year. For Yom Kippur is Achas Bashanah, it's only once a year. But yet this Achas, this one day, affects the entire Shana, the entire year, and all the seasons and changes of the entire year. And this is also the meaning of the Rambam, of why we blow shofar. The Rambam says, why do we blow the shofar? Uru yisheni mishinaschem. Those who are asleep should awake. Is the Rambam only talking about those people who are truly spiritually asleep? Those people who are in the 49 levels of impurity? Those people who are living a life of immorality and promiscuity? An unethical lifestyle? No. The Rambam is also talking about the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Holy people, tzaddikim, godly people. Spiritual people, those who are into meditation and into divine spirituality. Even these individuals have to awaken from their meditation, from their spirituality. Because the world is about action. It's about being proactive. And therefore they have to bring down this holiness to effectuate 
everything they do in the world. So, how do we end the Yom Kippur? After Ni'ilah, after revealing the highest level of the soul, after emulating the Kohen Gadol, the high priest that goes into the Holy of Holies, after becoming one with God, by revealing this Yechidah Sheb Nefesh, this unique unity that expresses itself on this day, we are told, blow the shofar. Why do we blow the shofar? That was for Rosh Hashanah. Why do you blow the shofar now on the end of Yom Kippur? Because we have to wake up. We have to come down from this spiritual sleep. The sleep of the angel, the sleep of the high priest in the Holy of Holies. The sleep where the soul and God becomes one. We have to awake from that sleep and bring the soul back down into the everyday world. And therefore it says that right after Yom Kippur, a heavenly voice comes forth and says, go home and eat. Become a person. Go back into the world of action. And furthermore, right after you finish eating, you know what you do? Go build the sukkah. Take a hammer and a nail and bang it together and build the sukkah. Do a physical mitzvah. It's not about removing yourself from the world. It's not about transcendental or spiritual or elevation. It's about physical, down-to-earth manifestation of godliness in all of our actions. And of course, the blowing of the shofar reminds us that if we truly repent, if we truly return to God, then that shofar will be blown by God himself to bring in all of the exiles with the coming of Mashiach. A story is told that Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Bardichev used to be the chazan in his shul. And before Yom Kippur, he was about to start Kol Nidre. And it's getting dark. And the shul is filling up. And he's waiting. And his students and his congregants and his chassidim are looking. Why is the holy Rab Levi waiting? Everybody's here. It's time to start. The sun is about to set. We have to start Kol Nidre. And he's waiting. Ten minutes pass and fifteen minutes pass. Twenty minutes pass. Half an hour passes. And finally, a farmer walks in to the shul. All of a sudden, the farmer walks into the shul, and Levi puts his talus over his head and starts Kol Nidre. All the chassidim say, oh wow, that guy must be a real holy tzaddik. He must be one of those 36 hidden tzaddikim. And Rabbi Levi Yitzchak was waiting for him to come into the shul, and now we can start the Kol Nidre. We're going to find out who he is after services. So uh, throughout the whole Kol Nidre and the whole night, they're waiting to go to this guy and ask him, who are you, where are you from, what's your mission on this world? And the service ends, and they bombard this farmer. Tell us, who are you? I'm a simple farmer, I live at the edge of the town. No, 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 you're not a simple farmer. You're one of the 36 righteous tzaddikim that holds up the whole world. Tell us, what's, what's your real cover, what's your real name? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a simple farmer. I live at the edge of the town. That's all I do. He said, no, no, no. You have to be a big tzaddik because Rabbi Levi Yitzchak waited for you to come. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm telling you the truth. Yom Kippur, even a, an ignoramus would not lie. I'm not going to lie to you today. It's a holy day. No, no, you're not leaving until you tell us what you did today. I got up in the morning. I davened. I went out into the field, and I was working all day in the field. That's all I did. That's it, you did a whole day, that's it. There must be something else. Well, you know, it started to get dark. The sun was about to set. I said, oh my goodness, tonight's Jim Kipper. So I ran home very quickly, and I jumped in to a bath. I got out, and it was literally three minutes left before Yom Tov. 
I didn't eat yet. I didn't eat a whole day. I was starving. And Yom Kippur is coming yet. It's a mitzvah to eat today. So I said, you know what? I took out a big bottle of bromfen. Big bottle of vodka. And I took a big glass and I filled it up all the way to the top. And I lifted up my cup. And I turned to God. I said, God, look. I have to be honest with you. I know Yom Kippur is coming. It's a day of tshuva. And believe me, I have a lot of things to do tshuva for. I admit, I missed a few words in the davening this morning. I admit, I'm not always the first guy in the shul. I admit that maybe Shabbos, I should be davening with more kavana, with more meditation. I should be learning a little more Torah. I admit that maybe I should give more charity. I'm only giving 9% to charity. I should give 10% to charity. I admit I made many, many mistakes throughout the year. But God, you know, let's call a spade a spade. Let's be honest. Why did you do this here? You know, God, look around the world. Look how many people are homeless. God, look around the world. How many mothers are trying to have children and they are barren. God, look around the world. How many young children die at childbirth? How many young people are sick? God, look around the world. How many young teenagers are trying to find a shidduch? They're trying to find their soulmates and they can't get married. God, look around the world. How many poor people there are? God, you know what? I'm not perfect. But neither are you. So I'll make a deal with you, God. I'll forgive you if you forgive me. And then I took the big cup of vodka and I drank it down. L'chaim. I said, L'chaim, God. And I came to shul. That's all I did. That's what I did today. They said, aha, now we know why. I believe he was waiting for you. He needed you to make that deal with God so that God should forgive the sins of all the Jewish people. And so, as we enter into Yom Kippur, we ask God once again to please do tshuva, bring a world of peace and harmony, a world where there's no more poverty and no more sickness and no more pain and no more suffering but to bring about the ultimate blowing of the shofar, the tekab b'shefer gadol, to blow the big shofar, the shofar that will herald in all the exiles, and then we will truly say at the conclusion of Yom Kippur, the Shana Habab Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem.